First of all, let me thank you for the church for hosting tonight and to the members of the panel. As you all know, I've had a very recent death in my family, my baby brother, my only brother. And uh, due to some family things, I'm not able to move as fast as I wanted to. And then we had a delay in planes and this, that, and the other. Um, and we are still we're going, we're trying to make it here. We got in late because the plane's late, and I'm actually having to stay all the way in Talladega, Alabama. But I want to thank, first of all, uh, Mark, you for setting this up through video. Thank all of the panelists that are there, especially as we honor uh uh, a hero and elder, and I miss uh, the Reverend Jesse Jackson. We always want to uh, thank you for his continuing, continuing work. Um, and I want to ask one thing. They don't know this yet, Mark, before I make these comments. Uh, there are a bunch of people there working with the Poor People's Campaign organizers, and either the Reverend Erica Williams or Laura Ashton, who's from Appalachia, uh, I want to invite one of them to come up and take my place on the panel. They know when repairs, they got to be also ready. So that they're probably, fuck, but if whoever, it's one of them that fell out in the floor just then when I said that. That's who it is, Mark. But uh, <laughs> if you'd have one of them, Laurel or Reverend Erica, to come up and participate in the panel. You know, you just said what Dr. King said in Montgomery at the end of the march, and he actually also said it was always the greedy aristocracy, the southern aristocracy that whenever there was the possibility of white and black people coming together to build power, uh, to change political power, the white, greedy aristocracy would sow division uh, for the purpose of holding on to the power so that then those persons that were elected would continue to cater to their desires, i.e. tax cuts to the wealthy and, and other things. Uh, we are certainly seeing that today, but we know how to beat it. Uh, I want you to know that as we talk about this tonight, and I heard Reverend Jackson say something a few months ago, there comes a time you have to stop just crying about what's going on and stand up and fight back. There's a scripture in the Bible in the book of Psalms that said the sons of Ephraim had everything they needed to win the battle but chose not to fight. We cannot be like the sons of Ephraim. Uh, we have to choose to fight back. And that's one of the reasons the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for a moral revival. We now have 41 coordinating committees in over 40 states, plus the District of Columbia, and thousands upon thousands of people are connecting. Uh, we're planning a major, major series, 28 bus tours in 28 states are uh, coming up in April, and then there's going to be a major Congress uh, June uh, um, of this year as we continue to build power, seek to change the narrative, and, and, and call the, the 140 million poor and low wealth people in this country. Uh, 66% of black people are poor and low wealth. Somewhere in the neighborhood of 35% of whites are poor and low wealth. But the number of poor whites exceeds the number of poor blacks by 40 million people in raw numbers. And when we look at all the persons who are poor white, poor black, poor Asians, poor Latino, um, um, poor native people, they, as Dr. King said, hold the transformational voting block for this country. Uh, the problem is too often, uh, we don't, we have, we don't even hear in our public debates about the poor. We have the middle class and we hear about tax cuts, but we don't hear often about the poor. And when Republicans talk about the poor, they blame the poor. And too often, to be quite honest, when our Democrats talk about economics, they talk about the, the middle class and the working class, but they do not talk about the poor, many of which who are, in fact, the working poor. We must change that, and that is why we build this campaign. One of the things I wanted to say tonight to kind of set the tone for the, for the uh, conversation was that new data shows us that there is this marvelous progressive future happening right now in the South. The South holds the key to the transformation of the country. And the South at this very moment is going through great demographic change. Why? Because of African-American remigration and Latino-Asian immigration. Don't be fooled. The battle to build a wall and the battle to stop uh, uh, immigration at our southern borders 
is not about Latino people coming in to hurt us and rape us. It's not about that. It is about the possibility of the black, brown, white coalition in the South that can keep, make sure that extremists no longer occupy the White House and the Congress and the southern state legislatures of this country. That's what it's really about. Amen. We know that from 2000 to 2010, the non-Hispanic white population grew at a rate of 4%, while the so-called minority population grew by 34%. By 2000, Mark, the South was 34.2% people of color, and that number jumped to 40% by 2010. That's why we have seen such an onslaught of voter suppression. That's why we see extremists fighting to to not uh, renew the Voting Rights Act. That's why we've seen 26 states pass voter suppression laws uh, since 2010, because there is a fundamental shift in uh, in the demographics of the South. Now, also in the South, while we have to connect systemic poverty and systemic racism and systemic poverty, and by the way, for the record, racism is not just about a picture and a word and whether or not you got a black person that you can use as a prop in a congressional hearing. <laughs> racism is about intentional, systemic racism. It is about policies. Policy. And so, for instance, in the South today, there are 52 million poor people. 24 million of them are white. 24 million of them are white. A little over 20, uh, uh, eight, seven million are black. In the 13 former Confederate states, one third of the total number of poor in the country are in the southern states. The number of poor whites in those 13 states is more than thir- one third of the total poor whites in the country. And here's another irony. All of the southern states have passed voter suppression laws. Uh, Many of the people in our state legislature, the governor's mansions, we saw what happened with voter suppression in Georgia and in Florida this past election. Many of the persons that are in our our congressional representation from the south, they are there only because of voter suppression, of voter suppression. And what what is an ugly irony, Mark, and to those that are there, they get elected by using systemic racist voter suppression. But once they get elected, they pass policies that hurt mostly poor whites. And that is why we have to feel this coalition of black and white and brown people in the South particularly. In the South, in the 13 former um, uh, 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 Confederate states, Over 13 million people in the South are without health care, are without health care. And the number of poor working people are in the millions. The number of people in the South that work for less than a minimum $15 an hour uh, is just egregious, millions of people. And that is why when we talk about raising the federal minimum wage to 15 We do not need a regional minimum wage. In other words, something different for the South that's different in other parts of the country. Because the $15 minimum wage, if we got to that, uh, the $15 minimum wage, living wage, is still $5 under what it ought to be if the the minimum wage had been indexed based on uh, economics since 1968. We got to, so we have this these economic and racist connections in the South, and we've got to build coalitions. Now, finally, in just Florida, Georgia, Mississippi, North Carolina, Texas, the total number of eligible voters is 56 million. In just those same states, 44 million are registered. But in, but in the last election, only 25 million voted. Listen to me. That means of only 44% of the eligible voters in those states I just named voted in the, in the last election. That means a lot of people are not winning because they're winning. Just like Trump didn't win the election, he was selected to be president, just like Rutherford B. Hayes was selected 
in 1877. He actually, there were 4.5 million people that voted against him, and it was only 80,000 votes in Wisconsin, Detroit, and, and uh, uh, I mean, in Michigan and Philadelphia that gave him uh, uh, a push to get the Electoral College. He won by 30,000 votes in Wisconsin, but, but there were 250,000 votes suppressed in Wisconsin because of voter suppression. If you look at the, the former slave states, South Carolina, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, Texas, Virginia, Arkansas, Tennessee, Delaware, Maryland, Missouri, and North Carolina, if that, that group of states that I just listed represent 176 electoral votes, if you can control those states, you only need, you need under 95 votes to secure the 270 electoral votes necessary to win an election, which is why every one of those states is a voter suppression state. And every voter suppression state is a high poverty state. And every voter suppression state is a state where the majority of its congressional representation and legislature the state legislators vote against living wages and labor rights and health care and immigration reform and protection of the LGBTQ community. And so what we know is that there is a direct connection between systemic racism and systemic poverty. And we also know finally, in those same states I just no noted, uh, 1.5 million registered black voters didn't vote. Hear me now. In those same states that represent 176 electoral votes that have put up all kinds of, of attacks on our voter, uh, voting rights and have engaged in all kinds of voter suppression, 1 million, 1 million, 598,000 African Americans show, who were all registered to vote, didn't need to get registered, chose not to vote. So we have two battles we have to fight. We have to fight the fundamental attack on our voting rights. We have to fight that attack on our voting rights and help teach uh, poor working class whites and others that an attack on black people's voting rights is also an attack on them, an attack on progressive policies that would guarantee them health care and living wages. And the truth is, as somebody said a long time ago, if we're black and can't pay our light bill, if we're white and can't pay our light bill, if we're brown and can't pay our light bill, so forth and so on, if the lights go off, we all black in the dark, so we better learn how to stand together in the light. That's the first thing. <laughs> and then secondly and finally, we must fight voter apathy because if somebody's trying to take your right to vote or undermine your right to vote or nullify your right to vote and you are registered and you still sit home knowing that they are trying to deny and abridge your right to vote. My grandmama who died at 82 years old had a word for that. She called it trifling. She said some things are just trifling. It's, it's something we cannot accept. And so we have to fight the attack on our right to vote, and we have to fight the apathy in the community and those who would dare come in our community and say, you ain't, there's no need for you to vote. When the reality is there's every reason and every need for you to vote because we face a time right now that is not just about whether or not the Democratic Party will survive or the Republican Party will survive, but whether or not the promise of America will survive. That's where we are now. And so I end as I began. In the Psalms, Psalm 78, I believe it is, the Bible says that there was a day of battle. God had blessed the children of Ephraim with everything they needed to fight and win. But in the day of battle, they chose not to fight. We must be the generation that ensures 
that 20, 30 years from now, nobody can say that in the day of battle, we chose not to fight. Instead, they must say, we remembered what God had done with us before. We remembered the battles we had come through before. And if the people before us could win with less than we have, surely we can win with all that they fought for that we might have. We must fight. 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 And the South must fight because we are the key to the transformation of America. Let's hear it for Reverend Dr. William J. Barber, Bishop Barber. Bishop, and we thank you. Sounds, he's so powerful. Sounds, feels like he's right here in the room, doesn't it? Even though he's on the phone. Bishop, we thank you. And, and again, what he's saying, that's why it's so important when this Trump regime is trying to keep us all as divided as possible. Because if we all came together in this way, things would be very, very different. Bishop Barber, I know you can't stay. Amen. Um, but before you go, I just want to... get you... Laurel or, or Reverend up there? Okay. Laurel or Reverend Erica? You see her. I know they're Erica, come on up here, Erica. Uh, Erica, one of y'all. Y'all decide who's coming up here now. <laughs> Reverend Barber is giving instruction to stand in his place. Bishop Barber, before you go, I just want your spirit also to be here to receive what I'm about to do. Ladies and gentlemen, I said to you that a very honored guest was coming in the room. She was here in Selma pregnant and in jail before many people even heard about the struggle here and you all know who that is Lillian Gregory has joined us please give her a round of applause oh, wow. stand on your feet on your feet for Lillian Gregory Lillian Gregory Mother Gregory go ahead Rem Barber she can hear you hello Mother Gregory we hope you're doing well we thank God for you. We thank God for the memory of Brother Gregory. But we also want to lift you up because the truth of the matter is we have made it male and female together. And we honor you as one of the great, great sisters and heroines of the movement. And so thankful that you, not only were you in Selma back then pregnant, but tonight we pray that your, just your being in the room with us tonight will impregnate with us with a new spirit to keep on fighting and standing for what's right and standing for justice. God bless you, Mother Greg. Thank you. She's back here in Selma, folks. All these years later. Reverend Barber, Bishop Barber, we love you. Give Bishop Barber another round of applause as he goes. You are in our prayers as well. Bishop Barber spends a lot of hours on the road, folks, and goes through a lot of physical sacrifice for us, so please keep him lifted up in prayer. Thank you, Bishop Barber. And take care. God bless you. All right, take care now. Let's hear now. And also, he will give us some historical context. Tell us where he was. I definitely want him to tell the story about hiding in the apartment homes, he and Andy Young from the police one night, as they were chasing him through Selma. The Reverend Jesse Lewis Jackson, Sr. Y'all can stand up for the Reverend, too. We wouldn't be here if it weren't for him, either. Good evening. Good evening. I am so delighted to be home tonight. I want to thank Mark, and especially for his commitment and for his continuous struggle. Give Mark a big hand, won't you please? When there were a few stars in the heavens that shone bright that we could, could not afford, or who could not afford to not be with us, one who slept with us and gave up her family and her children. Don't take for granted Lillian Greg. Lillian Sand again, baby. Love you so much. Somewhere between Memphis and Jackson, Tennessee, the man who cried out black power, even before Stoke the dead, was Willie Ricks. Shut up, Willie Ricks. It's always good to be here with the SNCC Freedom Singers, and 
our family. Let me make several observations. One, Selma is the birthplace a modern democracy for the Western world. It's not just for blacks, it's that too. Because of Selma, Mandela got freed one day. Because of Selma, Nancy Pelosi is chair of the House of Representatives. That's right. Selma. The Bible says, Rule not the ancient landmarks our mothers and fathers have set. Sometimes landmarks shift. When we were betrayed in 1877, 1880, took our voting rights back. And again, the 1965, 85 years later, blacks could not vote in the South. And as Jefferson Sessions said, it was an intrusion upon the rights of whites. White women could not sit on juries in the South. 18 year olds who were serving in Vietnam could not sit, could not vote in the South, in the country. You couldn't vote on college campuses. You couldn't vote bilingually. So you skip bilingually, you see English and Spanish in various languages. That's Selma. So in some sense, Selma is home for, for democratizing the world. We cannot reduce it just to uh, an, an, an ethnic celebration. But something happened. Uh, what made the voting rights different was it put a provision on it. Was the term of voting was most difficult. And on that, come here, Barbara Unwine, come up here. Let's see if we're talking Barbara Unwine. Give up again. She is here of transformative justice. Another big hand, Bob Brown Wine. Those who never want us to have the right to vote, they did not want us to have the protected right to vote. Say protected. To protect it. We could always vote, number of bubbles in a bar of soap. We always vote, except you had the impediments. And so the voting rights had protection. It was like troops in the South. When troops left the South after 1877, that's when Jim Crow and this violence came in. Shelby is the, the scene of the crime today. Not even Selma. And in they, in they, no, June the 25th, 19, 2013, they decapitated Selma. Mm. So now you have, in the name of, of, of racial justice, gerrymandering, which is, covers even more of us, as well, more of us should be in the room tonight. What, what, am I, what am I saying? I'm saying that Hillary beat Trump by three million votes. Mm. And a one person, one vote democracy, that's the winner. In 2016, in part because to me and others, we beat Trump by nine million votes. In that landslide of a vote in 2016, today we have 55 African Americans in the Congress. Yes, that is worth Most of us do not even know what authority they have. We've not stopped long to count up our blessings. When Maxine Waters speaks as finance chair, Wall Street has to listen. All right, All right now. Ed Bernice Johnson speaks uh, because she has, has technology. Silicon Valley has to listen. So we have a, a level of power now. We should be counting up some blessings, not just, not just looking back, but looking. Say, we fundamentally, fundamentally. do not know do not the, power the power we achieve November 6th. We ain't studied it. 55 black, 38 Latinos, mm -hmm. whose interest is fundamentally the same. 20 Asians, more than 100 women. Now, if that be true, 
Nancy could not be speaker without that vote. So we need more than a celebration tour of Sam. We need, she needs to come here herself because it, this Sam made her possible. I'm going to serve that. If the Freedom Party wins, they want some for their vote. Bunch of right-wing legislation. Trump wants the wall. That's his. What do we want? When the, when the, when the communist sun said tomorrow and Sunday, the meet the Browns Chapel. So I went to Browns Chapel. They come out. They turn left. They go out the corner. They, they, they look down. They go right straight across the bridge. The airplane go back home. If we got the Congress that we made possible, they get to turn right and go to some houses back down the street with toilets in the backyard. Miss Boynton's house is condemned. Why did Dr. King come to Selma? The Christmas before April, even before Snick really was here. Miss Boynton, she, she was head of the Dallas Voters League, right? She wrote, she went to see Dr. King at his house. You have to come to Selma. There's a letter along Highway 80 mm. in the museum that she wrote to Dr. King. He came in response to her because she knew she, he knew she was a responsible citizen. The same day that John and Jose got beat, she got beat that same day. It's a picture of her with a dress over her head. They beat her too. And she was the instigator that made this cookie crumble. You know what we so far? Now, so, so the next meeting got to be in Shelby. Because, because of Shelby, Democrats won by, by 200,000 votes in, in, um, in Virginia and lost by a flip of a coin. Jim Mandarin. Right. right. Because of Shelby, we find ourselves now, uh, D Detroit, uh, 11,000 votes was the margin, and you can't recount the votes in Michigan. We really won that race in 2016. <coughs> I'm going to step further here. Um, this is 2019. 400 years later. A lot of stuff between here and there. There's a Bible verse, Exodus 13, 3. It says, remember this day when God put his mighty hand in bondage and delivered you from slavery. What's our day of deliverance? What was the showdown point? It didn't just kind of happen there. The reason, the only reason I, I ain't so smart, the reason I got caught up in is because I'm a baseball fan as a kid, and Jackie Robinson was the guy, right? And Jack Robinson, Capitol, and Don Newcomb, Yankees, are all white team, would beat us somehow every year. We were broken hearted. In 56, we had Koufax, a Jewish pitcher, and Drysdale. They couldn't miss in seven games with two of them pitching. Koufax, I'm not going to pitch the ball game on first of the series. You got your mind? That was what Super Bowl is today. You cannot pitch, no. That's the, we promised God. If he delivered us, that we know there'd be nothing higher than honoring God that day. In Selma, Alabama, God put his hand in our struggle in ways we cannot fathom. Now, many of us, for example, the reason I extra 13, three and other, others talk, um, the Jews call it Yom Kippur Day, a high holy day. Right. Unless they get permission to wrap it, they don't, they, don't, they don't work that day except in emergency situations. Lincoln said in the fall of 1862, the South does not rejoin the Union, I will free them. He said, I know that they're your, that, that you, that they're your feet of line for the Confederate Army. They produced the cotton, which is the, the, the staple crop. Cotton was then what Silicon Valley is today. And so we, we, we will free them. Lincoln said, it's about the Union. He, he would not say it's about blacks because the whites in the North benefited from slavery too. Slavery ended in Vermont, not Alabama. Vermont came, came down that coast. Yeah, right. And he said, uh, well... If I could send them back to Africa, I'd do that, they cheered. If I could f f 
keep the union and keep them in slavery, I'd do that. But I'll even free them to save the union. We saved Lincoln. Lincoln freed us. You don't hear the trade off now. If we had not joined Lincoln's army, South would have won that war. There was far north as Antietam, Maryland. As far north as Gettysburg. The capital was in Richmond, Virginia, moved from Montgomery to, to Virginia. They were about to surround the White House. When we came up as in the movie Glory and fought back, we broke the back of the Confederate Army. We saved Lincoln. If we had not won that war, 4th of July would be this, this for something shot. If we, if we lost that war, uh, Lincoln would not have mattered so much because Jefferson Davis would have been the guy. I wish I had time to get into all this. I'm trying to, we, we're into a, a situation, we of all people must remember this day. And so Christmas Day meant nothing to us. We couldn't shop, we had no money, not even script. He said, but uh, December 31st, will Lincoln sign that bill? We can't protest, we can't march. We just signed, the, on, on, on the lobbyists we have is God. Will he sign that bill? The boss said they're going to kill him if he signed it. They did kill him, by the way. If you read the Declaration of the, the Emancipation, and I want you all to go and Google it tonight. Go Google the Emancipation Proclamation Night. That is the first time we, as citizens, the first time in this country. Well, it was, the 13th Amendment said to us, if Lincoln, if we were not Emancipation Proclamation, we wouldn't be no 13th Amendment. I want y'all to bear with me. Y'all bear with me for a minute? Oh, yeah. What I'm trying to say to you, my friend, is that we, we saved the Union and freed Lincoln, mm -hmm. and Lincoln freed us. So we've been in this struggle all the while. Yeah, yeah. But on that day, it said, once, as of this day, you were freed, it said blacks have the right to bear arms. Mm -hmm. If you leave your plantation and someone wants to hold you back, you can shoot them. That's in the book. You can man garrisons and forts. A guy named Smalls was manning the ship in Charleston Harbor. The, the guys went and got drunk that night. He took the ship and ran over into Union territory. The black man stole the ship, drove it into Union territory. We, in fact, have been the makers of our, of our dream. And so the point I guess I'm trying to make tonight is that we're marching across the bridge. We, we have the right to vote. 19 judges in Houston. 55 judges in the, 55 blacks in the country need one black on the Supreme Court at some point in time. I mean, you, you, you get that somebody. We, we need one. Now, what am I saying to you, my friends, is simply this, that the congressional delegation, Barbara, I want you to help me work on it tonight. We need to give them a petition tomorrow when they get it in Sunday. We want a congressional voting rights museum built in Selma. Mm. A congressional voting rights museum. You said it was modern democracy was born, Barbara. Is that, is that what was, you follow what I'm saying? Now, if, if, if you take the Congress, spending big, Trump cannot spend money without them. If, if you take the Congress, and can't get houses picked up in Selma, what, what is the vote means? Mm. So the vote, so the vote, the vote has, vote. To, mean, has to mean, do we have, we have the, power to vote? the power to vote? Those for whom we vote whom must, we deliver. must deliver. We need, we need our, share our share of education, of education and health care and, and investment and because, because we matter. I, I am somebody. I am somebody. Respect me, protect me, never neglect me. I am somebody. My mind is a pearl. I can learn anything in the world if my mind can conceive it and my heart can believe it. I know I can achieve it. Stop the violence, save the children. Stop the violence, save the children. Never surrender, keep hope. Alive. 
keep hope alive. Keep hope alive. Keep hope alive. Let me hear you scream. You're listening to us live at First Baptist Church here in Selma, Alabama, MIP at the Selma Jubilee. Thank you to Reverend Jackson for that. Thank you, Reverend Jackson. I wasn't trying to cut you short. I just needed to take a break. Um, you all notice all these women we got sitting up here? Now, I heard somebody say there's this saying going around that the future is female. Is it? Is that what it is? <laughs> And, and again, we, we're seeing more of this and we're thankful for that. And one of, uh, again, the people who's had a great impact on that and also made sure that black women and all women of color were included. Because for a long time, as we know, the feminist movement did not include black women and women of color. And, you know, she stepped in, she and her comrades, Carmen and Linda stepped in and changed all of that. So we're going to ask her now to talk about the importance of this vote, the role that the women have had, the role that the Women's March has had in that, and what the future means in that. But let's give Rem Jackson one more round of applause, because we, and we're not finished with him tonight. But, you know, some folks, some preachers get up and they know one story. You know how you can tell somebody only got one, preach only know one story, when they always preach Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, because you can always fall back on that. But Reverend Jackson, whatever pulpit he's gone, that's one of the things I admire about him. He's always taught us, too, about the history and the struggle. And everything he just shared with us is absolutely important for us to know and understand. And it's still biblical. What he was saying is, on his high holy day, Sandy Koufax wouldn't pitch. That's how sacred his day those days were to him. What are our sacred days? Bloody Sunday ought to be one of them. Exodus, Tamika Mallory. Give her a round of applause, please. They've been attacking this sister. You know that, right? Give her a round of applause because she's been standing strong. And all she was trying to do was make sure that black women were involved in this movement. And she's been under attack just for that. So stand with Tamika Mallory, please. Thank you so much, Mark Thompson, and to all of the brothers and sisters and, and siblings who have gathered here this evening. I am so blessed to come back to Selma one more time. You know, I've been coming to Selma for a long, long time. A lot of people think that you know, seeing me at the helm of leadership for the Women's March was the beginning of my activism. But instead, uh, you know, my parents have been part of the movement for, uh, since the very beginning of my life, you know, I, I've never known anything other than to be in the movement, to be a, a protester, a marcher, and, and someone who is a, a, a fighter for freedom, justice, and equity. My parents helped to start the National Action Network, which is Reverend Al Sharpton's organization almost 30 years ago. Uh, and so I certainly have grown up as a movement baby. And as I was sitting here listening to Reverend Jackson, I could have listened for the rest of the evening. How many of you would say the same? That, yeah. Um, you know, and just really listening to the history and understanding, and, and I encourage young people that are organizers today uh, to be clear that we are a continuation of the struggle. Not, it's not new. You know, a lot of young folks think that because they got in the movement that somehow it's new. It's a new struggle. Um, and maybe the ways in which we approach things are different, which I'm sure over, you know, in each generation there has been different tactics and different ways in which we have uh, approached uh, working for justice, but it is truly a continuation, and I am very proud to be sitting here, first of all, next to Reverend Jackson and here sharing the stage with my, my sisters, but also to be walking in the tradition, the tradition of those who are freedom fighters. The Women's March, um, you know, a labor of love and, and, and pain, some happy days and also some very painful days, uh, was one that happened very quickly. We know that on uh, uh, the right after the election of Donald Trump, 
um, the next day, a woman in Hawaii, a white woman in Hawaii, sent out an invitation to 40 of her friends on Facebook and said, we need to march um, because, you know, she was just so upset about Donald Trump becoming president. And, you know, there were many white women who jumped and they joined in with her and said, you know, they wanted to, to have this march. And first of all, they started out by misappropriating uh, the name. They uh, chose the Million Women March to call this particular day and, and, you know, black women, I don't know if you know anything about black Twitter, but it is a dangerous place to get caught. If you ever get caught in black, you don't want to be there because they slice and dice you on black Twitter. It's a lot of black women um, that, are, that are there. Uh, and so black women were rejected it immediately because we know that 20 years ago, the Million Women's March happened in Philadelphia where many women gathered. And, and you know, I was watching the other day Jada Pinkett Smith, one of her, uh, you know, her speech from that day, a very, very powerful day where, where thousands and thousands of black women gathered. And so to have uh, these women use the name really upset many black women and they were vocal about it. And eventually over the next few days, the, the name of the march was changed to the Women's March on Washington. I thought about, uh, you know, there were people who were still concerned about the use of March on Washington and how that was yet another appropriation of uh, black history. And so I called Bernice King, the daughter of Dr. King and, I, and Coretta Scott King, and I asked her, what does she think? Um, and, you know, we talked about it, and she agreed that many movements have, have used March on Washington. And so she felt that, you know, it was okay, but I asked her, would she get on the phone with these women? And again, at this time, it was basically white women who were organized and all over the country. And she got on the call and basically told them that it was not the name that mattered. It was what they would do with the use of March on Washington. And understanding the history and the legacy of that gathering, um, you know, in the 60s, what will you do with it? And how will you carry not just the name for a march for one day, but what will be the behavior after the march is over? And so she gave them a very strong call. And we went forward, organizing together. Uh, Linda Sarsour, one of my partners, a, a Palestinian Muslim young woman, a Mexican-American, Carmen Perez, uh, and Bob Bland, specifically uh, the, one of the white women who was involved from the beginning. We came together, the four of us, along with many others, Janae Ingram, and the list goes on, and my brother, my son, Lennon, who's here, was one of the few men in there, along with Mark, working with us um, every day. Over 70 organizers, uh, in, the, in the United States, and then we had people working all over the country to organize this effort. And, you know, I like to tell folks that it was a 24-hour program. You wake up in the middle of the night and jump in because people were working around the clock to make this thing happen. We thought that we would have about 200,000 people to join us for the march. And to see 5 million people come together worldwide was an incredible, incredible, incredible moment. But I, I often tell people about this one particular moment. I was standing on the stage in Washington, D.C., and people were coming, they, they were coming in with these pink hats that, um, I, don't, I know you all know about the pink hats, I actually hated the pink hats. Uh, I was so against them because I felt that while we were trying to work on a real powerful movement, people were more focused on knitting hats. And, and so I just rejected them. But one day, uh, one of my partners, Carmen, who I, I like to call the heart of our movement, she came to me, Erica, and said that there were grandmothers knitting these hats who couldn't make it there. And it was their way of being in solidarity with us. And so that's where the, the pink hat movement came from. And I was standing on the stage along with Sabrina Fulton, Trayvon Martin's um, mom. And we were watching this hill behind the stage where droves and droves of women were just coming. They were walking and you know, obviously we were very emotional of the turnout. Uh, at least 1.4 million women just in Washington, D.C. alone. 
and these women were coming down this hill and it was a, a sea. And I looked at Sabrina and of course in one moment we were very happy and proud and she knew what we had been through, the pain of organizing this. We were under attack since day one. Um, and, and, I, and, and I looked at her and I smiled and then I began to cry. Mm. And I started crying because I realized that if my name was Sandra Bland, all of those people would not have shown up in Washington, D.C. for me. And I said that to Sabrina, and she looked at me, and she said, where were they when my son was gunned down and we did not receive justice? These people did not show up. And I took to the stage that day. I had a whole speech prepared. You know, I was going to say all of these things about intersectionality and all of that. And instead, my speech became, all of you, the people of good moral conscience, have shown up here today because you just basically discovered racism and oppression. And that if you came to Washington to address one man being Donald Trump, you've missed the mark. I didn't come to do that. That was not my work. It was not my ministry to fight Donald Trump. I said to them, welcome to our world. Yeah. If you are feeling the pain of oppression and you are now beginning to experience what it feels like to be discarded, to be afraid, to not know whether or not your rights will be protected, welcome to our world that this is in fact the feeling that I, my ancestors felt when we came here shackled many, many years ago. And thank you. And you know, that day I think that they decided we were too powerful that we were dangerous because that was the message and that's the tone and the behavior that we have taken. We have not allowed people to romanticize and to be a part of this movement where the pink hats become a symbol of, you know, sort of erasing the pain that we have felt and the pain that has been inflicted upon women of color by white women, even within the feminist movement. We would not allow that to go undiscussed, unchallenged. And so they said we were divisive. In fact, the New York Times came out with a piece um, where women, white women said they weren't, they were coming to the march, they were excited about it until we got involved. And we said, good, don't come because you're not ready. You're not ready because the environment that we're creating is one that is going to have to be a place of reckoning and of truth telling. That that is what this space will be about. And so we, we did not, the conversation around race was not, it wasn't just something that happened, it was, it was our design. We made it that way. And we have continued to do that work over and over again. And I have said on many stages, I was watching one night, Mark, and I'll be done. I was watching um, when we, I, the second march was in Las Vegas. And I was sitting one night and it came up on my Facebook page and I sat and listened to my words. This was right before they began attacking me and trying to make me the face of hatred for the Jewish community. Um, and I was sitting there and I was listening to my speech where I said, white women, we need you. And, you know, don't just show up at big events, but I need you in our communities on the ground when we call you to be a part of real grassroots movements. Not just these things that, you know, get us together in large numbers uh, and some of these beautiful events. We need you to help us do the real work. And I really made a bold challenge. And as I sat back and watched that, I looked and I said, oh, this is what we did wrong. We were really in the, up in their faces. And when I say they, I'm talking about this system that seeks to keep us divided. 
because they saw that there were white women who looked and said, you know what, I wasn't there, but I want to be there now. I'm ready to do this work with you. I'm ready to walk with you hand in hand. And they continued to come and help us to raise funds and help us to organize. And that became the fear, the fear that we had finally been able to bridge a gap that have, has been designed to keep us from working together and to keep our communities uh, at bay. And so what we have continued to do and what we will continue to do is to provide entry points for people who have not been a part of this work. They have not necessarily wanted to, maybe they didn't understand, maybe they were in denial, I'm not sure, but I know that all of us today know that something is wrong, the air is not good, that justice is very, very, very far from being anything of a reality for many of our children. You know, we decided to march, and Mark Thompson was with us, when we marched from the NRA to the DOJ around Philando Castile. This was after the Women's March. We marched 18 miles from the NRA headquarters in a, on a real hot day in July in the summer uh, in that year, in 2017. And when we first called for the march, social media went crazy with people saying, what does gun violence and police violence have to do with women's rights? They said again, we were being divisive, that this did not make sense. But we were actually on the cutting edge. We knew already that gun violence was a major issue and that feminism had to also include the issue of black babies being gunned down all across this country. And so we held this march. And then we turned around and school shootings became a thing. And all of a sudden, everybody showed up in Washington, D.C. for the March for Our Lives effort, which we support. We are excited that that movement is there. But people did not see the importance of showing up for black babies until it began to happen to, other, to their children. And so what I would say in closing today is that what I realize is what Reverend Barbara said as he was closing today, that when you turn off the lights, meaning that when we are in darkness, all of us will look the same. And it is time, it is time and it's pregnant with opportunity in this moment for us to build a movement that is bold enough, strong enough, and wide enough to fit all people who want to see real and true and powerful justice on behalf of all people, not just some, but on behalf of all. And that is the movement that I am a part of building. And all those who want to be a part of that, that's what's going on with the Women's March. And that is why we are being attacked, because we have chosen to fight for the most marginalized people, those who are, who are considered to be on the bottom. They are actually at the top of the agenda for me. And as long as I'm doing this work, my people can always count that in every room, that's the conversation that I will be a part of leading. So thank you very much. Tamika Mallory, give her a round of applause. And don't forget, you all have an opportunity to ask some questions of these folks. That's right, you can stand up if you like. Amen. Doctor, it's fine, yeah. And we need to continue to defend our sister. Because she's so, she is so articulate. You know, it, folk, folk didn't plan for none of us to be up here. Yes. Single mother, leading women all over the world. That ain't supposed to be, right? So that in of itself is revolutionary. I always like to quote Dr. Saji Fokwame and Krum and Tamika and Ayana have heard me say this countless times. He, he said that you can de determine the degree of a nation or a community or a country's revolutionary awareness by the political maturity of his women. Dr. Nkrumah, he didn't say of his men, but of his women. So keep. Keep that in mind. Give it to Tamika another round of applause. Yes. Um, a couple of other acknowledgments before we hear from, from our other two speakers. Uh, we mentioned the churches of the movement. We were at Tabernacle last night where the first mass meeting was. We're at First Baptist tonight. Remember, it was against the law for more than, what, two or three Alabamans to just have conversation. Okay? 
And so, uh, so it was two, right? More than two. Right, because you could talk to your spouse, and then if somebody else came in, your son or something, they called the police on you. Yes, yeah, pray permit. That's what it was. Uh, the other church that is now present with us in the person of their shepherd is Brown Chapel. And you all know we'll meet at Brown on Sunday before we step off to March. That's where the march began. Uh, the pastor of Brown Chapel is here, the Reverend Dr. Leota Strong. Give him a round of applause. Just want to acknowledge him. A um, couple other folks, longtime activists in, in when it comes to uh, ending sentencing disparity. Whatever progress we've made on sentencing disparity in the past 10 years has been because of this young woman. Uh, she's also someone who, like me, has been involved in the reparations movement. I'm just going to say this, and we'll talk more about this later. Uh, know those and honor those and follow those who have been involved in working on reparations for a long time. Legitimate organizations like in COBRA and what Dr. Daniels formed, the National African American Reparations Coalition. There's some folk on Twitter doing some funny stuff with reparations right now. So just be mild for that. It's good that we're talking about it and that people are supporting it, but there's somebody just tweeted that they were surprised Trump didn't bring it up in his speech at CPAC the other day. His folk are pushing it out there because they want a Democratic nominee to talk about reparations because they think they can force the Democrats to lose on that issue. So they're trying to exploit our issue. But having said all that, one of our sisters who's been in the forefront of that struggle, Nikiji Taif is here. Give her a round of applause. Also with us, is he still here? Is Dr. Conrad World still here? Dr. Conrad World was here, Na National Black United Front, who organized. The, we, the, now, I saw my sister now when you said Million Women's March. And how many of y'all were the Million Women's March in Philly? Y'all remember that? That was, that was real march too, right after our Million Man March. Uh, I wasn't supposed to be there, but I went and was, was up on stage and wasn't supposed to be there. I think I was the only man on stage, but I made sure I was there. Just butted right in. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, we, we need to uh, uh, acknowledge that. Uh, also, let me acknowledge another uh, uh, fine organization uh, that spun off from NAACP. It was led um, by the great uh, Thurgood Marshall. I had a very close relationship with John Payton, and he passed away at an untimely, in an untimely moment. But um, the organization that got us through the Brown argument um, was the LDF, the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund is here. Give them a round of applause for being here. That was Kara. You brought up Philly, the Million Women's March. She did just like that, so yeah, that's right. And lastly, uh, a, uh, uh, one who was raised up in the LDF, who's now leading the New Jersey Institute of Social Justice, uh, giving the governor a, ho a fit stand on top of him. So many, how many young people are locked up in New Jersey? Shout it out. Black people in, in prison, Ryan? How many? Yeah. Several hundred. I mean, it's a disproportionate number of black young kids, but he's leading that fight. New Jersey Institute of Social Justice, Ryan Haygood, give him a round of applause as well. Now, Moving, uh, moving right along, uh, you know, Reverend Jackson and others helped me find, and helped me and not find, but answer and discern my call to the ministry. That's one thing ministers do. See other preachers, see the preacher and others. Y'all, somebody, y'all know, you laugh because you know what I'm about to say. You know who's coming next. Because she preaches. She may not mean to or know it, but she's a natural born preacher. Huh? She looking like she. <laughs> After leading um, um, lawyers for civil rights under law, now leading the Transformative Justice Coalition, and now every week has us on conference calls to deal with issues like voter suppression, even though I know Kaylin, I'm delinquent sometimes on the calls. They, they just raise a hand. Uh, <laughs> huh? That's what I'm doing. I'm talking too long. He said, I'm talking too long. 
Barbara Arnwine, ladies and gentlemen, the Reverend Doctor, Barbara Arnwine. Hi. Good evening, everyone. You know, God is good. And I am so happy to be in Selma with you today. Oh, yes. I want to start by giving a tribute to Reverend Jackson. The first person who ever brought me to Selma was Reverend Jackson. I, he, I didn't, I had never been, had never participated in a jubilee until he said, Barbara Arnwine, there's somewhere you need to be. And Reverend Jackson's vision has guided us through so many struggles and has helped us to see ourselves in a manner that nobody thought we ever should see ourselves as. It's powerful as intellectually amazing and brilliant and as strong, bold, and defiant. Oh yes, you know, this brother has been an inspiration to all of us. And when people talk about rainbow generation, when they want to talk about somebody who stood up to injustice, there is no equal living to the amazing Reverend Jesse Lewis Jackson Sr. Thank you. Thank you, my brother. Thank you. Now, you know I'm glad to be here because in October, early October of 2017, I read in the New York Times an article that said, too bad blacks aren't going to turn out in Alabama to vote. Too bad that, that the black vote is so apathetic. Too bad that the black vote uh, keeps disappointing the Democratic Party. This was in the article. October, I'm not talking about five years before, I'm talking about that year of 2017. And you know what happened? Every eye was on the race with uh, <laughs> Roy Moore <laughs> and Doug Jones. And I want you to know, Alabama, that you showed the nation who and what we are. I want you to know that nobody, they always want to tell us who we are, but we showed the nation who we are. People were saying, these numbers can't be real. This kind of black turnout is unprecedented, unheard of. It can't be real. Alabama, you set the nation on fire. You see, after 2016, when people thought that we had, quote, lost our verb, and when even, even, even with the amazing work that Tamika, Mallory, and the Women's March showed us for five million all over the world, even with that, people were still doing this naysaying. Oh, but Alabama. Oh, Alabama. Selma, Lord Selma. Oh, yes. You show the nation what happens when we are determined, when we organize, when we mobilize, because we know what the vote means. Oh, yes. So I am here not only because of what you've done, but because of the legacy of the Jubilee. You see, Bloody Sunday is more than a movie. Bloody Sunday is more than a historic moment. Bloody Sunday is a reminder to us that the spirit of justice calls out to be given birth all the time. 
And that it calls on us to actualize its highest aspirations. And that it's on us to step up every moment. So when I come to Selma, I don't see myself coming to a geographical designation. I don't see myself coming to just a historic monument. I see myself coming to once more embrace once more to prostrate my life before the tremendous sacred ground that has been built here. And that it, this is the movement. My voice, my voice is weak because I have not lain in a bed in 30 hours. Because I traveled overnight and I traveled all day to be here. But I'm going to tell you that tomorrow morning, join me and Reverend Jesse Jackson. Because we are going to have a tremendous panel. And we're going to be talking about voting rights under fire. And we're going to have, we're going to be at the George Wallace Community College. George Wallace Community College. Okay, thank you. All right. Oh, yeah. And we're going to be there. And we're going to have... Reverend Jesse Jackson and I are going to moderate the first panel, and Reverend William Barber is going to moderate the second panel. And we're going to be talking about an action plan, because, you know, talk is cheap. And all action isn't good, but an action plan that really is about actualizing our power is what we need. So I just want to say, giving honor to God, the Savior of my life, thank you for all of you who are here, because the work we do is the work that will make the difference. Thank you. Bob Rodwine, ladies and gentlemen, I told you she's a preacher. That's what preachers do. They preach till they lose their voice. Ah. Now, um, where, who said that? Where is she? Was she back there hiding? You had someone winning knowledge? You? Is that what you're doing? And that's the, that's the thing. We've been, you know, that's the scene for this coming election. You lift our vote 2020. Fire Rose Ture, give her a round of applause. She shouted. Hank was here. Is Hank still here? No, they do this every year, they lift up. And this is what Reverend Jackson would say. Where is Hank? Is Hank over here? Stand up, Hank Sanders. I don't know you were as light as right in front of me. This is what Reverend Jackson was talking about in terms of us having sacred days and sacred spaces. This is the only annual commemoration of any civil rights moment. We, others we do every five years or 10 years. But thanks to Hank and Ray, have you all been, how many of you been to the Voting Rights Museum? I'm always fascinated to watch people who come for the first time. They built that and funded that. Okay, we gave them money, they built it. Imagine how much more there could be in Selma if all of us treated this space in the sacred way it deserves to be treated. So thank you to Hank and, and, and Fire Rose. We appreciate them. Now, um, Reverend Erica, Reverend Barber designated you in his absence. Talk to us if you would, and we're gonna go back around the panel one more time and then we'll get some of your questions. Talk to um, us um, about some of the work the Poor People's Campaign is doing to combat voter suppression and raise a level of awareness when it comes to people getting out to vote, even in diverse communities? Well, whenever I open my mouth, I have to always pay homage to my grandmother, Willie G. Morris, uh, who was a native of Dothan, Alabama. Dothan. 
And the reason why I say that is because, as Tamika said earlier, we don't come here as people who just came here to do the work, but we stand on shoulders. So I give my grandmother that credit because I tell people all the time, she didn't have no education, but she had a PhD in common sense. And she was strong in her, fi her fight for voting because she had to go through so many things. And so tonight I'm here as an uh, organizer for the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for more revival. And I don't stand alone. I have colleagues in the back. We all stand together. I want them to stand because we do this work together, not isolated, but together. We are a movement of black, white, First Nation, Latinx, everybody. Poor People's Campaign, y'all. Poor, Poor People's, People's campaign. campaign, a national call for more revival. We do this together. And so I'm here tonight because one, I'm, I'm frustrated because the blood that's still on that Edmund Pettus Bridge, we got to do something about it. I come from Saginaw, Michigan, which is right next door to Flint, Michigan. And people always talk about the Flint water crisis, but what they don't talk about was our sisters and brothers in Flint got their democracy taken from them. Governor Snyder took their democracy and put in an emergency manager. And when he put in the emergency manager, he was the one who made the decision to switch the water from the Detroit River to the Flint River. And the Flint River was so nasty, the General Motors plant there did not even want to use the water because it was rusting the parts on the automobiles. But they figured they could give it to the folks there because 74.5% of the people there were poor. And that was white, that was black, that was Latinx. But what we said to them was, when you poor, you don't matter. And it was just not only in Flint, but also in Detroit, where the democracy was taken. And I want you to know, this past December is when Snyder left office. He wasn't impeached. And I tell you that because I think it's so critical for us to understand the water crisis happened because democracy was taken. That's huge. And even right now, as we're traveling this country, even in Kansas, one of the states that I'm working with, Dodge City, Kansas. I don't know if you've seen it on the national news, but the ACLU did a lawsuit against the city clerk there because out of the 14,000 residents in Dodge City, they only had one poll in place. And the poll in place that they had was so far from the city limits, folks couldn't even get to it. There was no public transportation, nothing for them to have access to it. And that's critical because 14,000 people, and let me let you know, that area is largely Latinx. That's brown sisters and brothers. And so y'all, it's critical, and I, I, I'm, I'm glad Reverend Barber asked me to speak, but I'm here this weekend because I'm frustrated that every year I come back here, Selma is not getting better. If we could be honest with it, and my sisters and brothers from Selma, what I'm saying is, I don't see them putting in the resources that need to be put into Selma, because there are too many great folks living here in Selma, Alabama. Too many people died on that bridge. Too many people are still fighting every day for the right for people to vote and to have a fair and decent life. And if we can't get the right folks in office to do what we need to do, we need to vote them out. And so we can come here and commemorate, but we got to put our boots to the ground like these foot soldiers on this front row did 54 years ago when they said, as Fannie Lou Hamer said, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. We have got to get, as Reverend Jackson said, we got to get focused, and y'all, we got to stand together. Black, white, Latinx, First Nation. That's what the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for more revival, is doing around this country. A lot of Google, internet, on Facebook. Sure, we can find out. <laughs> Five generations. Five generations. In every southern courthouse, that there were no blacks in America, there's not an account. You're nine of us, ten of us, twenty of us, three. So every African American, every African American, on plantation, it's kind of, they're not our slaves, our ancestors. Stop calling them slaves. My great grandmother's not my sister, she's my great grandmother. I want to get one more time. So every African, every African, came off a ship, came off a ship, which counts. Which counts. Somebody's archive tonight is when your great great, just, just for the generation, did She's a thousand without Google, without the internet. 400 years become small compared to a thousand. You talk about most of the time, that's 3,000. Yeah. I was going to say, I'm trying to say, we have a lot of things to get a little deeper 
that just reflect on who did what yesterday. Yeah. Yesterday has its place. Yeah. But today and tomorrow is our challenge. Thank you so much, my friend. Yeah. Well, just We're the first Baptist of Selma, MIP of the Selma Jubilee. Now, we are finally hearing for the first time the importance of black women's vote. Yes. You know, and, and Barbara brought up Roy Moore. It was really, it really came to fruition right here in Alabama because of no good Roy Moore. And so, Tamika, um, do you feel that black women as an electorate are being more respected and being given more deference going forward? And are white women finding more woke than they were in 2016 and willing to vote? their interests more so than the interests of those who are not looking out for them. Yeah, I mean, the answer is no to both of those things. I don't think that black women are being respected more, um, although 94% of black women voted for Hillary Clinton, whether we liked her or not, right? So we, we knew that we had to, to vote not just for black folks, but on behalf of all Americans, and yet we have not been properly respected for that. There's not enough resources in our communities to even help us to do the work. So what we're doing basically is, you know, knocking on doors and contacting family members and doing all the, the campaign work without a doubt. Be able to do that work. It's just something that we do because we know we have to. We understand the importance of turning out and of ensuring that our communities are as protected as possible. Most people don't even necessarily know nor believe that uh, turning out to vote is going to actually benefit our communities in the ways in which they should, and particularly younger folks. But I think that, you know, Grandmama would say, we have to participate anyway, and we follow because we know that we have to. Uh, but yeah, I don't think we've been, we're being respected as we should be. But to go to the second point about um, whether or not white women are voting for the interests of all versus just their own interests. I mean, look at the numbers. It's very clear when we think about what just happened in Georgia right. that Stacey Abrams was clearly the most qualified person for that seat. And in fact, not only was she most qualified, the current governor was an actual racist crook. So even if you didn't think she was uh, the best for the job, you definitely shouldn't vote for somebody who should be in jail and certainly should not be in position. But white women voted for him. 77% of white women voted in that election. And when you look at the numbers in general, we see over and over again where white women are continuously, no matter how black women show up, white women are continuously going in the wrong direction. There, I tell white women all the time, there's some real work that has to be done in your communities, at your kitchen table. You know, I, I was saying to a white woman the other day, and I've actually been saying this for a while, I have a son who's 19 years old. He's a Morehouse student, um, and you know, thank you, Erica, for mentioning the history we, of. We went to school. He, where did what? Where is he in school? He's at Morehouse. He's at Morehouse, sir. He's, I'll say it again. He's at Morehouse in the house. <laughs> um, a and is a university. Morehouse is a college. <laughs> Lord Jesus. <sighs> anyway. Uh, um, you know, when my son gets ready to leave home every day, or, you know, even when he's at school, I almost strip him of his manhood, Mark. You know, I call him, I'm like, don't say anything, put your hands down, keep your, don't, don't talk back, get, you know, if anybody approaches you, yes sir, no sir, just get home safe, get home alive. Because I understand that if he <coughs> expresses even the slightest bit of male confidence and, 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 and push back at this system even a little bit, 
he could lose his life. Mm. And so even though his mom is considered to be this big bad activist, I'm still right. constantly telling my son that if you are approached, not just by a police officer, but by a white man or woman in general, that you need not use that as a moment to be the activist or to even stand up for yourself. I need you to get home alive and we will deal with it later, right? <clears throat> That's the conversation that I have to have with my child. And so I had a white woman look at me and say, I don't know how to talk to my family about politics and race because we don't do that in our homes. And I said to her, if I have to pretty much demoralize my child every single day and you can't ask your mama who she's <coughs> going to vote for, we can't go anywhere together. There's nowhere for us to go because you are unwilling to do the basic work the basic work of having the difficult conversations with your family members that it is not okay for us to say that we are for a, a, a movement that is for us all and that I am your sister and that we are post race and we are we're getting past all of that and that we need to be in this new world together and yet and still every time there is an opportunity for you to show up and show out you are not doing it. You are not doing it. That's a conversation that, unfortunately, we have to have it. We have to have it. We have to be able to say to white women that you cannot claim to be my sister and feel that it is a, you, you, your place is better in the room with me rather than in the home with your family members working on the ingrained racism that is there within your family. That is something that it's unfortunate, it's painful to hear. I'm sure that, you know, again, people look at us and they say we're being divisive when we bring these things up but if we don't have those conversations you're going to continue to have black women say I don't want to march with you I don't want to work with you I don't feel safe being in a movement with you when I know that you're not going to do the difficult work of being uninvited to family occasions being the one in your family that that everyone that people may or may not call you the black sheep so that you can do the real work. And that, unfortunately, Mark, it has not been happening. Now, where's the opportunity? Because there is an opportunity. I see it in the Women's March every day. I do see that there are women, not just white women, because if you look at the numbers, it has not only been white women who have voted the wrong way. We even had Latina women vote for Donald Trump. If we really want to talk about the real numbers, it has not, it's also been some women of color who have also turned their backs on marginalized communities. And I think that the opportunity in this moment, having the Poor People's Campaign, having the Women's March, and having these different entities that are providing educational tools for people to be able to have these conversations, these courageous conversations, is it's work that is difficult for us as people of color, but it is work that we must participate in. So we're doing that work every day. Because what I realize is that it is very difficult for people to sit down and look across the table from someone to someone that they love and challenge them on things that are very difficult and very painful. And so um, I would just say that in this moment, what I'm inviting us to do is to be people in this movement who are not just happy being in safe spaces, but that instead we are willing to walk into some of the most difficult places in our communities because I can tell you that black folks do that work every day. We are talking to Ray Ray on a street corner every day about putting down the gun. And we must also be talking to Mary Lou about picking up the, the, the responsibility and the mantle of doing the work on behalf of those people who have been and discarded in our society. Thank you, Tamika. 
Um, Barbara? Yes. Wait a minute, is Malika still here? Did Malika? Yeah. Where is she? She's hiding. That's Malika Sanders, the new, the new state senator who succeeded her father. Now, I think Reverend Jackson may remember this. We were at the 40th anniversary of the March on Washington. Okay. Speaking of Stacey Abrams and women running and the power of women. Thank you. Um, he said then that one day Malika Sanders would be governor of Alabama. Uh oh. Now, we had the power to make that happen, don't we? And we proved it with Roy Moore. Give Malika Sanders another round of applause. Um, those of you, we're going to hear from Barbara Arnwine, because I know Barbara wanted to respond to some of the things Tamika was saying. But also, Barbara, um, allude to what is happening now because this is what's important yes russia on behalf of trump targets our votes yes they don't target nobody else's votes why is that when did we you know wh what is it what does russia know about us and the way we vote and the difference our vote makes that they would target us putin having meetings about black people and the black vote so that's if 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 we are important to him, shouldn't we be even more important to ourselves? So, Barbara, if you could talk about how we're being targeted again, and I know you want to respond to Tamika okay. too. Okay. Anybody have questions for the panel? <coughs> Anybody? Because I want to come to you in a minute. Okay, go. Yes, please, Barbara. Well, first of all, Fire Rose, are you still here? Yeah, there she is right there. Fire Rose. I wouldn't be here but for Fire Rose today because Fire Rose is the person who sent out the call through Lenny Dustin for me to help and be part of this year's Selma Jubilee. Mm. Now, the one thing I love about Fire, Fire taught me something very early in my civil rights practice. You know, not just the fact that she's this amazing woman, the first black woman judge in the state of Alabama. Not only is she this amazing activist, but she said something to me that really resonated. She said, never take your eyes off the young people. And she has mentored so many, good Lord, the fire rose cadres around the country. And I just wanna say to you, fire, that, you know, it's, this work isn't a bed of roses. No one is throwing the petals at your feet saying, you're great, you're beautiful, you're remarkable. But I want you to know that we know that. That you are everything for us. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Love you, my sister. Love you, my leader. So, Black, so white women, white women vote according to every study we've done and what they see is in the best interest of their white husbands. Number one determinative vote is what they believe will strengthen their white husbands. Racial hierarchy in the United States based on white structural racism has always been about the white supremacy of the white man. The white woman, unfortunately, has been willing to subordinate her own best interests to that of her husband. And that creates a fundamental contradiction with black women. Because our duty our number one duty in life is to dismantle and destroy white structural racism. White supremacy has no, no reason, no justification for existing. It's immoral, it's harmful, it's dangerous, and it is destructive. So it requires us to really think about what kind of engagement we're having. Because, 
you know, your family is one issue. But if you don't understand structural racism, if you don't understand it's more than the individual attitude, that it's all these structures that keep people in jail, it's all these structures that explains the disparities. It's all these structures that explains how African Americans have lost one half of all our wealth since 2007. Tell you know, these are the lack of understandings. There's too much individual talk in our country instead of talk about how do you restructure society. For example, I think it should be illegal for there to be private prisons. Yeah. I Period. Agree. Period. There's no reason why private prisons should be allowed. Profit. None. Profit. For profit. Cash bail, we know it has no business existing. There are so many things that are structurally wrong in our society that we need to really think differently about how we approach all these issues. Because see, if I can get a white woman, a white man, a black man, a black woman, to talk about structural racism and its destruction, then I have done my job. Because if you don't take it to that level, then we don't make the kind of progress we should have made. And that was the tragedy, right, of the Obama administration was that it, for all of the beauty of that, of, of the Obama family image, et cetera, the inability to talk about and deal with structural racism is what left so many of our people hurting at the end. And our joy, our beauty, our pride in our accomplishments overcame our reality of watching the erosion of our wealth the erosion of our status. So the Russians aren't dumb. Mm. They look at America, they said, okay, the Republicans want to play the game of racial denial. There ain't no racism. In fact, we got a black woman, we'll make stand up and show you that Donald Trump is not a racist. Oh my God. Oh my God. We got exhibit A. That's what it is. Black woman. I was waiting for him to tear her blouse open. It's our bus. You see, the auction block, a new version of it. So I think it's really, really key for us in this era to understand that the Russians say, buck all of that. We understand that the fundamental divide, as W.E.B. Du Bois articulated it over a hundred years ago, is the color line. That we understand that racism drives this country. It drives its economic policies, it drives its social policies, its political policies, all of its engagements. And therefore, we're going to use race to divide this country. So, in 2016, we now know because of the Senate Intelligence Report, but not a lot of us knew before then, that the Russians spent hundreds, millions of dollars to tell black folks not to vote. To tell black folks that their vote didn't count. To tell black folks, oh, you're so great and politically aware and awoke that you don't need to vote. That you're going to do a protest vote. Vote for Jill Stein, vote for somebody else. And we did not have built into our framework, into the infrastructure of our communities. We did not have built, Reverend Jackson, the defense mechanisms to say to our community that is absolute trash. And that is, gay, that is designed to destroy us. They said to white communities, them blacks, got too much. They're too uh, proud, too lazy, too dependent on the government, uh, too many single mothers, whatever they could come up with. They came up with all these lies to make the white community angry also. 
So I want us to understand that they haven't stopped. Okay? Not for a second. They're very active right now. And sometimes when I am, you know, I'm very active on Twitter, right? I'm very active on Facebook. And so I will see bots saying crazy stuff. And I will absolutely call that and say, hey, hey, um, And it's usually the minute I say it, they disappear. And that, there's thousands and thousands of them right now. And they've infiltrated our dialogue. And they have redirected a lot of the African American dialogue away from what we should be talking about and into very superfluous nonsense. So what I want us to do tomorrow, Reverend Jackson, is that when we talk about the in our session, Tamika will be on the panel. Uh, it's going to be at 9.30 at the George Corley Wallace State Community College. The auditorium. That's the, that's the, Wallace the Wallace College. Community College at the auditorium. And we're going to start at 9.30. We got two back-to-back -back panels. And we're going to go until 12.30. So we want everybody, everybody, everybody to show up. Yes, I saw a hand. We're going to get to him. Erica, let, let Erica want to say to respond to you quickly, and we'll get to, the, get to everybody. Uh, just real, real quickly, I want to point out, as I said earlier, there are 140 million poor folks in this country. 63 million of those folks are poor whites. And I want to make that very clear, that we make that, that, that distinction. And out of that 63 million poor whites, the largest demographic is poor white women. And so I would admonish each of you tonight to go and read our audit from the Poor People's Campaign. It's called The Souls of Poor Folks, America from 1967 to Current. Go on poorpeoplescampaign.org tonight. There's a fact sheet. How many of you got the fact sheet tonight for Alabama? If you didn't get one, raise your hand and they can bring you one. Can y'all bring those fact sheets? Because we did an audit on America on what we saw. And I want to be very clear tonight. If we remember the Southern strategy by Richard Nixon, on what sought to keep poor whites and blacks and others of divided. What we're saying in the Poor People's Campaign is we gotta start politicizing folks. Yeah. So they can see what's really going on, as you just said, and others have said, we gotta make sure that this information, this political education is brought forth. Reverend Barbara always uses a saying, we shouldn't be loud and wrong. <laughs> I know that. And when you speak, you got to know what you're speaking about. Right. And so I just want to say tonight, as we go through this weekend, I don't want us to leave this place and go back home business as usual. Right. Amen. I charge each and every one myself, even as I'm sitting here tonight, that we got to really begin to go and go deeper in our communities. Most of us here are already working, but we got to get deeper engaged. We got to know more about what's going on. As you said, there are so many different places we can look to get research. I'm going to give Baba Dick Gregory uh, some props and shout out right here um, sister Gregory one thing whenever we saw him he had newspapers right whenever I, I lived in DC mm -hmm. for three years when I went to Howard he had newspapers we need to have as Reverend Barber say the Bible in one hand if that's what you read and the newspaper in the other yeah. and we need to be researching because there are things happening while we're asleep so don't leave here this weekend the same y'all mm -hmm. because if we come back here next year I pray that the ancestors will come to us individually and let us know I'm waiting on you because the blood is going to be on our hands if we don't do what we do, what we need to do. Amen, amen. Um, Mark, got some questions. I'm coming. Yes. Make sure, I just wanted to make sure that we say, when we talk about movements that have been started and how people have tried to steal them, the Me Too movement, our sister Tarana Burke, is a mentee of Fire Road. That's right. Coming from so, Selma right here. Yeah. So that movement also came out of Selma. I'm coming to, to questions and answers. First of all, how many foot soldiers are here who are on the bridge? Raise your hand, stand up so we can acknowledge you. And thank you. These are folk on the bridge who risked their lives. Thank you. I'm Dr. May Christian from Miami. My family lived in Raymond, Oscar Gamble died last year, we played with the Yankees. But my grandfather sent me to the bridge to represent the family. I wasn't expecting what happened. I want to say to you, Jesse, do you remember 
They had killed John Kennedy, they killed Malcolm X, and they killed Dr. King. To show you the power, remember we were marching from the bridge to go to Resurrection City, and they had a lady named Lurleen Wallace. She was the governess of the state of Alabama. We were praying and putting flowers and candles along the road, follow the road, so, and she said, you are not coming into the capital over my dead body. You remember that? Over her dead body. So when we got to Montgomery from Selma, guess what? We met all the police officers. They was mad. They made us get off the bus, remember? They made us get off the bus. We don't know what happened. She died overnight. She died overnight. But she said over her dead body, and when we got there, she called it, and it happened. It's true. So I'm telling you, the power of this movement ain't never went nowhere. It ain't going nowhere. I'm in Florida. For some reason, the Poor People's Campaign, SCLC, y'all need to come to Florida. Y'all talk about what happened in Georgia, suppression. We on the, across the Mason-Dixon, too. They, they told us 80,000 votes was not counted. But we know it was more than that. They found our ballots all in the post office, right? Of 80,000, the machine's not working. The machine shut down. Guess who in control of the machines? Your governor. Guess who in control and the secretary of state? In control of the codes to the machines. All right? So we need y'all, while y'all in Selma and Alabama, we need y'all to come to Florida. Them people sleep. They just as sleep as Miss Lurie Wallace. Thank you. Hey, Christian, foot soldier. Uh, Mark, I'm gonna get it. Mark, Mark, I raise a very concrete point because we've talked a lot along. People, it kind of blurs in. I'm making an appeal for, for Jesus. Bethlehem is the holy place. The Jews across the Red Sea is that. That's our spot. Yeah. Now it takes on religious, not just political meaning, because it's God putting His hand, taking us out of bondage. All of the Nancy Pelosi's and. All of the, the, the chairman, all that stuff is because of Selma. We must demand that they build a congressional center on, on, on voting here for the world. Because we, we, set, we, set, the, we set the team, the same from, 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 uh, from Nkrumah down to, to Mandela. But why can't it be built in this place? Got, got a military base out here, but nothing on it, for example. That they got, there's the room here. Is the historical place. You'll be coming in for forever doing research on voting and voting impediments. Can I get a witness on that? Amen. 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 Hands up. Amen. Hands up. Let's, let's amend your performance <clears throat> because we also need an ongoing training institute for our young people. That'd be part of it. And because a museum is one thing, but where we really need, you know, when I walk into a room, what do I look for? I look to see who's in the room. I look to see where are the young people. Mm -hmm. I look to see where are the women. I look to see where are the people of color. And I think that one of the most important things that we make mistakes of the way we think. Our society has two amazing underutilized resources. Young people, for one. People, when we look at them, we say, oh, it's so sad they're unemployed. Guess what? Unemployed can become deployed. You can actually take and give people the opportunity to work in their communities on our behalf. They can be voting rights advocates. They can do the work that needs to be done on the educational plane. But we just look at people in the wrong way. The other resource is, of course, seniors. There's a lot of African-American seniors with capacity. And we ignore them. Uh, and I think that, you know, we, we, there's a whole need, Reverend Jackson. Museums, I love them. You know, you can't get me away from the Blacksonian. 
in Washington, D.C. I love it. But we need training. We need educational structures. We need all the missing frameworks that would change this movement and reorientate it into the kind of power that Reverend Barber is already harnessing. And I just think that there is so much that we can do. And as part of reparations, reparations is not just economic. It has to be political. If you look at every nation that's made any significant advancement for any prior disadvantaged persons, they all had to restructure their political systems to make sure that those people had real power. Yes. So reparations, let's think about what does it mean for political power? Go along, go along. Come right next. All right, let's go. Thank you. Tamika, I really feel you when you talk about your son and that how you were afraid to let him go out and you were telling him to be careful and not to go places. Six years ago, my son was 19 years old. And uh, it wasn't as bad six years ago as it is today. But I found out when we capture our black men and put them in this huddle, they fight each other. Okay? So what happened with my son's generation is they started fighting one another. Okay? That was the bad policy with that. And then when I thought about what you said, I actually thought about the Willie Lynch syndrome. That formula that was given on the Jamestown River that said, if you make them scared, if you take their pride and their decency, then we can control them for the next, what, 2,000 years? It actually works. So first of all, we got to break away from the chain of the Willie Lynch syndrome. Mm -hmm. And I understand what you said. And Erica, I need your card because I want to work with you. Well, I'll tell you one thing. One thing I can say is that my son certainly, we know he doesn't listen because he sure has a freedom fighting spirit. So no matter what I'm telling him, he is in his own right beginning to develop you know, the spirit of leadership, and he, he's, he's fighting back, you know, he, he, Colin Kaepernick really did something to young people. I think before that, my son, it didn't really click for him because he, he's grown up in a, a different experience. We pretty much have sheltered him, as you said. And he kind of looked at me and said, I know y'all are doing all this stuff about justice and civil rights and all of that, and it's cool, but my friends, we all right. And we're all races and all backgrounds. You know, he's gone to school with everybody that you can think of until going to Morehouse where there's, you know, obviously all, most mainly black students. Um, but when Colin Kaepernick took a knee, it changed my son. And even more than that, he, even, he didn't even seem like he was paying attention at that point. But it was when other people didn't respect why Colin Kaepernick took a knee that I began to see a shift in him. And today, I, I see my son online fighting and, and, and telling people, fight back, fight the power. So it, in each generation, our young people will grab onto their own thing if we set the tone within our households for them to be, you know, fighters in their own right. So I'm, I'm really proud of him and I'm proud of all these other young people across the country, to Barbara Arwine's point, that are doing real work. They are sacrificing and they're standing up and they're standing up in very, very courageous ways. Um, in the Voting Rights Museum, our next uh, person with a question was uh, inducted into the Legal Guardians Hall of Fame. Give her a round of applause today. <laughs> Sister Jeribu Hill. Thank you, Brother Mark. Good evening, brothers and sisters. Just wanted to uh, make a couple of quick observations and, and give honor to everyone on the panel and to Sister Faya Rose and Brother Hank for always being the people who bring us, being the catalyst for us coming here. I wanted to just put something on your minds and hearts as we talk about revolution, as we talk about accountability, as we talk about what we want as black people, as people of African descent, as those who are the descendants of the blood of the slaughtered. I want to know when are we going to stop giving away what we have for free? Now we've been tricked and bamboozled as Brother Malcolm said. We 
prop up on every leaning side, every Democrat. Every time the Democrats need black votes to push them over the top, we're there. We need to start talking that's not just about the two parties, the two white supremacist, white male-led parties, except for a blip every now and then, and that won't happen again. That will not happen again. We need to ask ourselves, what are we doing to really, really expand the dialogue and expand our options so they don't stop, they will stop taking us for granted from the Black Caucus to others who believe if we just vote. I'm in Mississippi. We vote more than anybody. We got the largest number of Black elected officials in the country. And we suffer like you can't believe. So I just want to put that out there because we need a second wave of dialogue around our issues, and we don't need to give it away for free. I, I want to put that in the form of a question, Reverend Jackson, because in 1984, 1988, we dealt with that being taken for granted. And, and you were gracious in not splitting us all off. And Because if you had said, let's go, y'all remember the movie in Malcolm X, when Malcolm moved his finger? No, so I have to deal with ethnicity and, and ethics. I get that. You know, Reverend, I need to see you, Reverend. Let, let me hold that for you, Reverend. So you won't. Let me let me hold that for you. I got you. I I I'm, I got it. So I'll make sure I'll make sure you take care of it. We'll I'll give it to Shelly. I said, go ahead. Who? No. Let me. I just want to make make this point and go. And I must go. I'm I'm old and decrepit. She's talking about the senior citizens. She's talking about me. And I was going to be there at night. I got the Parkinson. I got, I'm a southern white, a southern black male. I have an attitude that I allow to be there at night to get up early in the morning, you understand? Know yes, and pray. Now, <laughs> on a very serious note here, we have come together tonight to think through what's next. The moral morning session at Wallace College at 9th is a big deal. We must advance our thinking. Every time I, I thought about this place, I thought about the empty space at the air base. When, when the president flies and he flies into uh, the air, airport runway here in Selma, all that vacant space could be a great place for a, a research study on democracy in the Western world. I mean, I mean, from 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 Egypt to South Africa to, to Mississippi to Chicago, it all fits in. Now we have a different kind of issue in Chicago, y'all. It was up the election last Tuesday. Two black women are running for mayor. Two black women end up being... That's great. That's great. Runoff. Two black... Yeah. No matter what, a black woman will be the next mayor of Chicago. Yeah. It's a runoff between two black women. That's, That's progress. So, that, so, 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 so you can't use race as a judgment. You can use which one makes the most sense. Right. See, the, the agenda, the agenda shift now from, from what color they are to, 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 to what, 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 where they're going. Yes, sir. That, that, that's very different. Now, because some, some of us, we, we get race. Race is important, but it can't, it can't be a crutch. So there's no substitute. There's no substitute. For thinking. For thinking. 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 Matters. Matters. See y'all now, I got to go. Reverend, before you, let's give Reverend Jackson a round of applause. <laughs> Charles, let Reverend come and sit next to Lily Gregory so we can get a picture there together. Come on down, man. Come, come this way, because those are the stairs. Somebody come up. You're not coming down here. And, and Dick Gregor had a strategy, and it always worked. If you go and they threaten you, don't react. Control Dick said they, so he went on the joint in Mississippi. What's that? All the chicken, white boys got upset, said, well, when you get through, we're going to do the same thing you that you did that chicken. <laughs> Dick said, bring the chicken on. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> Hold it. We're gonna bring Reverend out as he comes. We're gonna get another, another question in. Here you go, sir. Um, Reverend Jackson, I, I I've been listening to the panel, and I I feel like the one thing that has to happen is that it has to go back to where it started in order for it to be successful. I know that. I wasn't born in 1965, but what I do know about 1965 from research is mass meetings created 
wisdom. And that's what it's got to go back to. It's got to go back to the church, which is where it started at. If you bring it to the church, then you can bring the right thing out of the church. That's what people get confused with what people actually want. The young people want to believe in something, but they have to believe in the issue first. And if you bring them together in a mass cause, just like a march, but you bring it back to the church, you ground it. And just like building a house, you don't build a house from the top. You build it from the bottom. You got to lay a foundation. The church has always been the foundation for what's right. And so when, when Reverend Jackson said, things happen because of where it was grounded from, that's how things will change. When you bring it back to where it started, from the beginning and bring it into the church. Was there another hand up somewhere? All right, Shelly, hold it before you go. That's what's up. I guess I, I just would chime in on that, Please. brother, and say that I agree with you that the, obviously the church is a major foundation for me and my life and how I grew up in the movement. But I think we also have to think about bringing mass movements to the street. So in addition to it being, if our young people are not interested in the church, then we also have to have ways to do as Malcolm did and meet them on street corners in whatever communities that they're in. All right, was that, did I see another hand somewhere? Johan said, come on down here. This is Dick Gregory's youngest child, his baby boy, Johan said, give him a round of applause. This is the 10th child. <laughs> Lillian Gregory had 10 children, y'all, Lord have mercy. Johanse, please. Good evening, everyone. How are you all doing tonight? It's always, always a pleasure to be back here in Selma. Uh, and while my mind, that's right, where my mother was in jail and for two weeks, and she was pregnant with twins, one of which is my sister Paula, who just came in. Paula, if you can stand up real quick. So truly, we've come full circle with the Gregory family now. Oh, before you do that, let me get all the Gregory children and grandchildren down here with their grandmother, the freedom singers and the foot soldiers to take a picture with Ms. Gregory before Reverend has to leave. Y'all come on together. Now, like I said, there are no shortage of things on my mind and I would love to talk to you about so many of the stories that my mother and father gave me here in Selma, but I came here this year for a different purpose. And that is to carry on the work of my father. For any of you all who are familiar with the work of Dick Gregory, you will know that he never stood behind anything that he did not have personal ownership in. In all of his years, he never advertised for anything that he did not own. And just like the sister was saying here earlier, we've got to start giving, stop giving things away for free. When we talk about what we're doing here in Selma, we've got to continue that on. So last year when I came and met with Mama Fire Rose, I asked her, how can I help? How can I be of assistance in carrying on this legacy? So I'm gonna ask you and you'll hear me throughout the weekends. For those of you who are here visiting, please make sure you come up and make contact with me and we get and exchange information because we have to grow the numbers of folks that are coming not only here to visit and take care of what is free, take advantage of what is free, but participate and give back to Selma by being a part of this movement. And not just, not just with our participation and our feet, but with our dollars. We have real concrete strategies in place like the sister Reverend Erica was talking about. So please, I will be here all weekend. If you were here from out of town, make sure you pull me aside and that we talk so we can get you on board with continuing the work of revitalizing Selma. Thank you. You want to check out Roland Martin Unfiltered? YouTube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And subscribe to our YouTube channel. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. It's Roland Martin Unfiltered. See that name right there? Roland Martin Unfiltered. Like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's YouTube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And don't forget to turn on your notifications so when we go live, you'll know it. You want to support Roland Martin Unfiltered? 
be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. It's Roland Martin Unfiltered. Support the Roland Martin Unfiltered daily digital show by going to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Hey fam, want to check out Roller Martin Unfiltered, the blackest show on all of digital cable and broadcast. Want to check out our audio podcast. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. It's Roller Martin Unfiltered. Press play.